All right, in this lecture, we get to discuss the second uh, revolution of the medieval period, British exceptionalism. Uh, British exceptionalism is the idea that there's something special or exceptional about the British people. Uh, we're going to discuss where they might have gotten this uh, idea from and how was this idea passed on and what does this mean to us as Americans. Um, three things I want the student to be able to do after this lecture. First, identify the connection, the, the connection between literature and cultural values. How, do, how does literature express uh, the values held by a particular culture? Secondly, um, I want the student to be able to illustrate the idea of British exceptionalism from literature. And thirdly, I want the student to be able to evaluate uh, the origins of American exceptionalism. Um, I, uh, let's start with a definition of British exceptionalism. I believe I've already uh, given that. This idea that there's something sp special or exceptional about the British. Um, exceptionalism usually has a divine component. Like God has chosen this culture to be exceptional. God has created these people to be special. Uh, and in a certain way of thinking, British, exceptional, uh, British exceptionalism uh, was inherited from Roman exceptionalism. Uh, in Virgil's Aeneid, um, Virgil expresses a cultural value, a, a culturally held belief that Rome was put on this earth with a divine purpose to rule mankind and make the world obey. Uh, there was something exceptional about the Romans. Uh, if the medieval period is truly an attempt to return to the glory that, that was Rome, it should not be surprising that another culture kind of another culture took up this call, took up this 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 purpose, that there is something special and divine about them, um, and it also forms the foundation for American exceptionalism. This idea that we are a city on a hill, um, but let's look at some of the pieces of literature that illustrate this idea for us, uh, and the first uh, set of of books comes from the legends of King Arthur. Arthurian legends are fascinating to me because they they were written in a time period from the 7th or 8th century through the 14th and, and 15th century, covering almost the entire medieval period. You had books uh, written, stories written about King Arthur from several different cultures. Um, obviously Britain was one. You had books such as uh, Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, you had uh, the Mabinogian, you had Sir Thomas Mallory, Le Mort d'Arthur. Um, obviously, King Arthur as a, a Briton uh, appealed to the British. What's surprising to me is that you have, you have Arthurian legends from France, the, the Vulgate Cycle, um, Cran de Troyes and Lancelots and, and, and such. You have um, German legends of King Arthur, uh, Tristan and Isolt. Uh, you had Italian and Spanish conception. So for 700 years, almost every culture in the, the Middle Ages had their own idea of Arthur because it meant something to their culture. Arthur in some way reflects what that culture wanted to be or who they thought they actually were. Um, and this is not just in literature. Uh, in Britain, there was a, a, a book written, Geoffrey of Monmouth's History of the Kings of Britain. And in Geoffrey of Monmouth, he tells the story of Arthur. Uh, there, there are a couple of historical sources for Arthur, uh, Gildas and, 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 and some other uh, like Anglo-Saxon chronicles that do mention a guy named Arthur who was a Briton who helped protect the Britons from, from some, some other cultural groups. Those references are very brief. We don't know much about him. We're pretty sure that a guy like him probably existed. <laughs> but beyond that, we don't have a whole lot of historical evidence for it. Well, uh, I believe this was like the 10th or the 11th century. Um, 
Well, actually, it was uh, 1136, the, the, the 12th century, in which Geoffrey of Monmouth was writing. And he tells his own history of King Arthur. But in Geoffrey of Monmouth's history, King Arthur was a military leader that took the British army into continental Europe and conquered and unified Germania and Francia and Hispania and all, all that was the Roman Empire in, in Europe. And he continues on into, uh, into Italy, and King Arthur comes to the gates of the Roman Empire. Uh, I'm sorry, of, of the city of Rome. We're going to press pause on that narrative to point something out. Um, according to Geoffrey of Monmouth, King Arthur unified, was the first and only person to unify um, Rome as it was known in the classical period. Did this actually happen? We have no historical evidence that Geoffrey of Monmouth actually marched into Italy. Uh, I'm sorry, that King Arthur marched into continental Europe or even down into Italy. Um, why would Geoffrey of Monmouth tell this story and pass off his history? Because Geoffrey of Monmouth was trying to make a statement as to who Britain thought they were, how important Britain thought they were. And by reunifying the Roman Empire, Geoffrey of Monmouth puts England at least as equals to the glory that was Rome. Now to continue the, the story, the, the, before King Arthur laid siege to Rome, he, he felt he really missed Britain. And he told everyone to pack up, let's go home. Uh, I really miss Britain. They, so what Geoffrey of Monmouth is saying here is not only is England equal to Rome, but King Arthur saw the glory that was Rome and preferred England to the glory that was Rome. So this is a portrayal of England not just as equals to the Roman Empire, but superior to the Roman Empire. Uh, this is great evidence of how the British people thought of themselves. How the British people thought of themselves. Um, Fascinating. Uh, the second episode, the second narrative that I want to discuss that illustrates uh, this idea of British exceptionalism is a story of a guy named Cademan. Cademan was a, um, a sexton. He was a janitor. He was a, a, a common laborer at a monastery in a place called Whitby in, in, in England. Uh, and at these monasteries at night, they would have, instead of fellowships, they had things called beer ships, uh, <laughs> where they'd gather around the campfire, they'd uh, drink some beer, and they would pass around a harp uh, that was set to an open chord so anyone could strum along and sing. And this is how they entertained themselves. No Netflix, uh, no Xbox, no movies. This was their evening entertainment. And... One night around the campfire, the harp was being passed to everyone. It got around to Cademan, and Cademan was, uh, was not educated, he was not well-spoken, and he was terrified of participating in this and ran away and hid in a barn. And uh, in this barn, he fell asleep and had a vision where an angel came to him and said, hey, look, I want you to go back to that campfire, and I want you to sing the story of creation. And Cademan woke up and returned to the campfire and began to sing the story of, of creation. Now keep in mind, according to the story, Cademan is not educated, doesn't know how to read or write, um, does not have musical training. But the account given uh, in the Venerable Bede's uh, Ecclesiastical History of the English People tells the story of how Cademan sang beautifully. And Cademan sang the story of creation, and everyone was amazed. They said, wow, Cabin, you have a gift, a gift given by God. I want you to go and share this gift. Now, that story in and of itself is not exceptional. Here's the one detail I left out that makes it exceptional. Is that when Cademan sang, when Cademan developed his poetry, he sang and wrote in the Anglo-Saxon language. This is a time when the official language of the church was Latin. 
And if you wanted to contribute to uh, theological uh, debates, theological discussion, you wrote it in Latin. But for whatever reason, Cademan's under the impression that this doesn't apply to him, that he can, he can speak theologically in Anglo-Saxon, in his vernacular language. Where does he get the idea that this is okay? I mean, the Pope speaks in Latin. If it's good enough for the Pope, it should be good enough for Cademan. But Cademan thinks that the rules don't apply to him. Uh, or at least this is how the story is framed, that uh, British people are important enough that they should be able to do theology in their own language, not the language of the Pope. Um, it's kind of like a cow that uh, uh, Cademan chews the, the uh, green grass of Latin Christianity and out comes the milk of Anglo-Saxism. Um, this is the, the second of the three episodes we're going to talk about that, that illustrate that the British people thought that they were pretty important. Uh, still do, actually. Uh, <laughs> I'm not making fun of British people. My, my, my family's British. Uh, and when we get to American exceptionalism, you'll realize I'm you know, definitely not framing this in, in, in a negative way. But when you look at Jeffrey Monmouth's story of King Arthur, when you look at Cademan and, and his ability to sing in whatever language he sees fit, you get the idea that British people think there's something special about them. Third episode is King Henry VIII. King Henry VIII uh, had a problem in that he, uh, he needed a male heir. His family had just come out of a period of war and instability. He needed to ensure that he left a legitimate male heir so that England can stay prosperous and peaceful after he's gone. Problem is, is the only child he had was a female, a daughter with, uh, with, uh, with Queen Anne. I'm sorry, Queen uh, uh, Catherine, uh, Catherine of, of Aragon. This bothered Henry. He knew he needed a male heir, so he went to the Pope and said, "Hey, can you give me an annulment? I married my brother's wife. The Bible says that's a bad thing to do. Shouldn't be a big deal to just kind of pretend this never happened, right?" Now there's a problem. Catherine of Aragon's uncle was Philip of Spain who was currently occupying Rome. So the Pope was under the control of the Holy Roman Emperor, the Spanish Emperor, who was the uncle of Catherine of Aragon. Of course, the Pope isn't gonna to wanna to upset the guy who's holding him hostage. Of course, Philip of Spain is not going to let the English king humiliate his family by divorcing Catherine. So the Pope does not give the annulment to the marriage. And, King Henry VIII still needed a legitimate male heir, not the, the, the illegitimate one he fathered with some other girl, a legitimate one that the English people would recognize. Uh, so about this time, the Protestant Reformation was bubbling up in Germany, and this idea um, that the Pope is not the head of the church, but the local ruler is the head of the church, became very attractive to King Henry. Uh, so he said, uh, thanks uh, so much for your help, uh, Mr. Pope, but you know what, England, we've got it. We, we'll, we'll take it from here. And Henry VIII broke the church in England off from the papacy, and he set himself up as the head of both church and state in England. Where did Henry get the idea that he was important enough, that he had the authority to just say, look, no, we're gonna do our own church. Thank you very much. Uh, Henry VIII was not a fan of Luther. He was not necessarily a Lutheran. Um, I mean, he did use Lutheran ideas in order to buttress his own arguments, but King Henry VIII thought that what the Pope said he can and cannot do does not apply to him. That he is special, he is exceptional. So that is another episode that illustrates this idea of British exceptionalism. Um, well, this idea uh, also became the root of American exceptionalism. Because we have to remember, uh, as Americans, originally we were British. Uh, the American Revolution was a civil war. It was British citizens against British uh, citizens. The whole reason why we went to war was this idea that Britain was denying our rights as Englishmen. We were being taxed without representation. Uh, they were courting troops at homes, things that you could never do in England. 
they were doing here in the colonies. Uh, but let's rewind from the American Revolution and go back to uh, where New England was founded. New England was founded by two groups, Pilgrims and Puritans, two different things. The Pilgrims were Protestants that thought that King Henry VIII's um, Reformation did not go far enough, and that the Church of England, the Church under Henry, um, was not legitimate. They wanted to break off from the Church of England and do church however they wanted to do church. So they, they, that's why they're not separatists. They broke from the Church of England to come to the New World and practice their religion as they saw fit, which it takes a certain amount of arrogance to think that that is uh, a good idea uh, or that that's acceptable, uh, especially within the, the intellectual framework of, of England in that day. The second and the larger and the more influential group of people were known as the Puritans. These are people that did not think that the Church of England was corrupt beyond salvation. They thought that the Church of England just needed some tweaks. It needed to be purified, hence the name Puritan. So when John Winthrop led this group of Puritans over to New England, um, he preached a sermon on board the Arbella, on, on board the ship that's called the Model of Christian Charity. And in this sermon, John Winthrop claims that the reason why they're coming to the New World is to do Christianity the right way. And they were going to do it so well that they were going to demonstrate to the rest of the Church of England. They're going to demonstrate to Lutherans. They were going to demonstrate to Catholics how this should really be done. They were going to be the standard and the example for everyone. Winthrop talked about his uh, project as being a city on a hill and the eyes of the world, not just England, but the eyes of the world are upon us. And if we deal rightly with God in this endeavor, God will reward us. And if we do not deal rightly with God in this, God will punish us. Where did John Winthrop get the idea that what he was doing was so important that everyone in the world had their eyes fixed on what we were doing, our experiment. Well, because he was, he came out of the tradition of British exceptionalism. Uh, and that gave us a sense of our own importance as Americans, right? Um, uh, when Winthrop and the Puritans came over, they, they described themselves in part as the new Israelites. That they thought they were on par with Israel to a certain extent. Uh, and we see this language being repeated in the American Revolution. We see this language being repeated in the Civil War and in the World Wars that, hey, we are a light. We are a beacon to the rest of the world. Um, you know, it's right on the Statue of Liberty. When people sail into the New World, there, there we are as light to the rest of the world. Um, yeah, uh, I personally don't necessarily have a problem with American exceptionalism provided that it's not exclusivism. I believe God did make us with a special purpose, that we have been able to contribute to the world. But you know what? God has a special purpose for Kenya. And God has a special purpose for Moldova. Uh, to think that we are special in God's eyes uh, over and against everyone else, uh, that's problematic. Um, but a, uh, this idea of American exceptionalism uh, is fascinating because it it, it colors how we vote. It colors how we think of ourselves in the church. We think of America as um, the lighthouse for the rest of the world, and we're sending all these missionaries to these these foreign con uh, these foreign countries, and we're bringing Christianity to them. Um, and that ignores some statistical realities. That, uh, for instance, there are uh, the 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 Center for Global Christianity at Gordon Conwell estimates that there are more Christians in China evangelical Bible-believing Christians in China than there are people in the United States. That's mind-boggling. Christianity is exploding in Latin America and in Africa. Uh, I'm a part of the Christian and Missionary Alliance, and we, for over 100 years, have been sending missionaries to the Philippines. The Philippines just sent over 20 missionaries to the U.S. last year. Christians in other countries are starting to send missionaries to us uh, we don't necessarily think of our place in global Christianity as being the receiver of missionaries. We think that we, we kind of control 
how Christianity is, is, is spread. Um, Korean and Chinese and Japanese Christians are making tremendous headway as missionaries to the Middle East in areas we don't, we're not welcome, we don't have access to. Um, where do we get this idea that we're the center of global Christianity? Well, we can trace it back through this a tradition of Roman exceptionalism, British exceptionalism, uh, and finally American exceptionalism, which draws on Roman exceptionalism as well. This walk around Washington, D.C., and it's pretty clear we think that we are the new Rome. Um, anyways, these are fascinating ideas to talk about and discuss. They're fascinating ideas to explore how they color our Christian faith, how we understand our Christian faith and, and, and where we stand in, in the universe. Thank you for your time.